Good morning. If we could go ahead and come on in and take our seats. Good morning and welcome to our summer lecture series as we continue to look at what it is to be a church member's role involved in various activities of church life. Today we're going to look at, through Dr. Ligon Duncan, what does it mean for a church member to be involved in the act of worship. Now, Dr. Duncan needs very little introduction to our congregation. He has been a friend to this congregation for many, many years, but just in case you are new here, Dr. Duncan is the Chancellor and CEO of Reformed Theological Seminary. He has written a number of books, including one called it says, Grace Grow Best in Winter. If you are going through or know someone who is going through a time of suffering, that book is an incredible benefit to you. I cannot urge you enough to go out and to grab that book and to read it. An easy read, but it will do you uh, a world of good. Dr. Duncan uh, has been the senior minister at First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi, which is where I met him personally. He has been my pastor, he has been my professor, he has been my boss when I was an intern, he still put up with me, and he is today a good friend. Now just to give you an insight of how well Dr. Duncan has loved me and my family, just a quick story. When it was time for me to graduate with my MDiv in 2014, I was already here but traveled back to Jackson for the graduation, had done most of my work in Jackson as an intern at First Pres there. You know, intern or, uh, graduations, there a, a lot of stuff goes on. You have to march in and sit down and then all the different speakers and then all the different students come up and they get all their degrees and you're just waiting for someone to mess up in the midst of all of that to get the first giggle out and then the whole thing can go fine. Well, as most things that have to do with Dr. Duncan, it ran smoothly, like a Swiss watch. No hiccups whatsoever, and then came the exit. And so Dr. Duncan was leading the exit. Uh, every professor behind him, all of the students behind him, must have been 150 people behind him. And then all of a sudden, everything grinds to a halt, and like uh, boxcars at a train, da -da 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 -da, we all just stack up, right? And then you hear the congregation giggle, Right, And then we just keep going. And you think to yourself, okay, somebody must have tripped or something, no big deal. As soon as I get back to the atrium area, Melanie, my wife, makes a beeline for me with a smile on her face. Uh-oh. She goes, did you see what happened? It's like, no, what happened? Well, apparently, AJ, my youngest daughter, was sitting on the aisle or on the pew by the aisle. And as soon as she saw Dr. Duncan, she jumped out into the aisle, ran, and gave him a bear hug. <laughs> and that's what had caused everything to come to a grinding halt. Sounds on brand for Squires is. When you have a minister who loves your family so much that your children can't help but go and give them a hug when they see them, it's hard for you not to love a minister as well. Please give me a, uh, help me give him a warm word of welcome as we welcome Dr. Ligon Duncan. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Josh. I forgot to ask, uh, will the deacons come down with the baskets to collect the offering? Sorry, one more time. Will the deacons come down with the baskets to collect? Oh, they already happened. Already yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. I, I did, by the way, I did get a hug this morning. Uh, one, of the, one of the young uh, children of the church uh, who didn't know me from Adam just decided that she was going to throw her arms around me when mom and dad were greeting me at the door, and that's all good with me. We have, uh, Josh will know we have... Um, we have a number of special needs children at First Pres in Jackson, and we have a, a Sunday school class for them called the, the Special Friends class. And uh, one young lady in particular uh, who has Down syndrome, uh, I, I look forward to her hug every Sunday at church. Uh, they're, they're just, there's kind of nothing better in life uh, than that kind of affection for a pastor. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to Psalm 95. I, I get to 
address you today, and I, and I mean I get to address you. This is like throwing Br'er Rabbit in the briar patch to tell me to talk about public worship and the, and the worship of the people of God. And I especially like the way that the organizers of the summer series have sort of phrased the question for, the, for, the, for, the, uh, for our topic today, which is about your role as congregation members in worship. What, what do you do in public worship? What, what's your role in the congregational worship of the church? That's something I love to get to talk about because normally I'm talking to pastors and ministry leaders about what their role is in serving you. And so it's a particular joy to get to encourage you in the very important role that you play today. Now you get you get a one point sermon in in church today, but this is a six point message with five subpoints under the last point, okay? So, but look, here's the good, here's the thing about it. The one point sermon is probably more complicated than the than the six points with the five subpoints that I'm going to do uh, today. So, and and I'm stating that these points are stated uh, with imperatives, but it's not meant to be command. It's really meant to be encouragement. I'm, I'm, I'm stating it in the, in the form of an imperative, but each of these points are meant to encourage you and really to make you realize some, a, a lot of you are already doing all of these things. And part of what I want to do is I want you to make you realize what you're already doing and be blessed by that. Uh, so think, think of this more as encouragement than exhortation as we think about our role in the public worship of the church. In Psalm 95, which really contains two passages that are very famous in Presbyterian churches as calls to worship. Uh, the, and you'll know immediately the two passages when I start reading them. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing for joy unto the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. You, you'll be familiar with that. You've heard that as a call to worship in this congregation and in other places before. And then skip down to verse 6. Here's the, here's the second call to worship that you'll know. Come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. In both of those calls, you will note the word come, which is a clue that the psalmist is talking about what we do together not just about our private devotions. We, we know from the Psalms that the psalmist rose early in the morning for his private devotions, and he also had his private devotions in the evening, morning and evening. He would be with the Lord in private worship. And we're familiar with family worship, and normally family worship is done in the morning and in the evening. But when you hear the word come, that indicates that you need to go somewhere in order to do what's going to be done. And the public word come is a call to the congregation to gather to meet with God. And so I want to give you six encouragements in the form of exhortations about what we do when we come together to worship, and all six of them have the word come in it. And the, the first exhortation slash encouragement is simply this, come. Come to worship. Gather to worship the living God. Now, I'm standing in a room that is full, people lined up along the walls in the back. Uh, I'm not fussing at you. You're here, right? This is not, I'm, this is, I'm not doing this at you. Uh, what I'm saying is it's really important for us to gather to worship. And in, in the wake of the pandemic, that has really been disrupted in a lot of places. In, in lots of Bible-believing churches that 
that I know and attend and preach in and benefit from and know the pastors and the elders in the congregation, attendance is way down since the pandemic. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think, for instance, for people who are more frail of health, since this pandemic is the gift that keeps on giving, and it, it just you know it just seem it will never go away. We keep having spikes, and uh, the reason my wife is not here is last weekend she contracted COVID, and she won't be officially uh, you know uh, uh, out of quarantine until uh, tomorrow. So she's been upstairs at the house. I've been downstairs at the house and I've been sending up food to her via a trolley and, uh, and all, all this sort of stuff. So me and the dogs are just hanging, hanging out downstairs. Well, it, people with health concerns and, uh, particular illnesses and such are, are nervous about that. And so I know that there are a lot of folks that have been shy about coming back to public worship. I think some habits probably formed during the pandemic. You know, it was really easy to turn on church, right? Wasn't it? You know, you, you sit down in in your in your living room and you click on television, and there's no getting dressed for Sunday Sunday church and driving downtown and finding a parking place and you know either getting in if it's raining or you know whatever is so so simple. It's really tempting. Now, look, I'm very thankful for all the technology that's available to us. Um, there are, it, it is rare that on a Sunday morning when I'm getting ready for church in Jackson that I'm not watching First Pres Columbia. And so I'm thankful for that, for that technology. And I'm thankful for the way, look, think of people that are truly shut in, who are incapable of being able to come to church and the, the way it allows them to be connected to us. That's a good thing. I'm not complaining about that or fussing about that. But for those of us who can come, coming is really important. It is really important for us to be together. Um, a number of years ago, I was here at First Columbia for a Sunday evening service, and Sinclair was preaching. And he got up at the beginning of the service, and he said, something is going to happen tonight that has never happened before and will never happen again. And he said, what we're about to do in this room together in the next hour or so will never happen again. The same people will not be here. Even, even in a church of this size, the same people aren't going to be there ever again on, uh, on that occasion. And, and his exhortation to us was not to take that for granted. And I, that has stuck with me. I have thought about that over and over and over again uh, through the years. When we gather, it's never going to be the same again. And so we really need to savor those moments together in public worship and view it as a tremendous privilege. And things will occur and God will deal with our hearts and speak to us through his word in certain ways that will never be exactly the same again. I bet you're like me. You have memories of ways that the Lord has dealt with you in public services of worship over the years that are very much a part of your testimony and your Christian life. Um, there, there are just certain occasions where the Lord has spoken very clearly by his word in public worship. I'm, I'm thinking right now of when I was a teenager at the public worship service where my youth pastor was being ordained into the ministry. And I had been going through a time of real spiritual trial and temptation and struggle. And, and the Lord dealt with me in the course of that public worship service. And I can remember thinking at the end of that, it was a Sunday evening service in Augusta, Georgia at First Presbyterian Church. Many of you will know John Oliver, who was the pastor there and who taught at RTS Charlotte for many years. At the end of that service, I remember sitting in the pew. Everybody had left to go to the, re to the reception. I was still sitting in the pew. And I was thinking, this is where I belong. I, I belong with the people of God. These are my people. Now, that, you know, was, I was visiting the congregation. I wasn't a member of the church. I was there because of my youth pastor being, being uh, uh, ordained. But I, I just felt these are my people. 
And it, it, it settled for me a great struggle that I was going through in my heart. Had I not been there, I'm not sure how that message would have been delivered. Glenn Connect used to say, the sermon you miss is the sermon you need. <laughs> remember, remember Glenn saying that? It's so true. The sermon you miss is the sermon you need. We need to come together. And that is a glorious, glorious privilege. Don't underestimate the significance of just coming. And let me just say, as a pastor, I, because I get to sit and listen to messages more than I ever used to get when I was just uh, pastoring one local congregation, now I'm preaching in multiple churches, multiple times a month, multiple cities, multiple states, multiple countries, and uh, so I'm out and about. But when I'm not preaching, I get to listen to, to services more than ever. The thought crosses my mind regularly it amazes me that anybody showed up to listen to a sermon that I preached. I'm profoundly thankful that people uh, would come knowing that they were going to have to endure me. Uh, for I know they're not coming for me. I know they're coming for God. I know they're not coming for me. They're coming for Jesus. I know that they're not coming for me. They're coming for the word. But look, I do get in the way a lot when I'm up there preaching and reading and praying and such. And it really amazes me. Uh, that people faithfully come. So by the way, when you come, you're also encouraging your pastors and your elders and the leaders in the church. It's an enormous encouragement to look out and see the people of God gathered to give him praise. I um, substituted for my pastor in Jackson, David Strain, early on during the pandemic when we had no one at all coming to the building and where everything was online. And so I sat in that cavernous room, First Presbyterian Church Jackson, which holds about 1,400 people, with not a soul in the room. The camera is on the back wall, and I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, okay, I'm preaching to a camera. And I, I thought, you know, first I thought, I'm glad I can serve my pastor this way. I can't imagine what it has been like for him for several weeks to have to preach in a sanctuary with no people. Really, really hard. And I, I've never taken for granted what it is to have a room full of people to, to, to read the Word of God to and to encourage in the Lord. I'm just, that's, one of my sins is, is not taking those sorts of things for granted. I, I got a lot of sins, that's not one of them. I really appreciate that. But boy, I've appreciated it more than ever before after seeing all the various disruptions during the pandemic. So don't discount how important it is to come. It is really important to come. And your presence is an encouragement to others. And that leads me to my second point, which is encourage and help other people to come encourage and help other people to come. Now, I don't mean to get all up in their business and give them, give them uh, exhortations left and right when you see them missing on a Sunday. More, I'm thinking more of you wooing some and then assisting others. Um, I, I have been blessed on many occasions to see members of my congregation go out of their way to take notice of certain people in the church who need help getting to church. Uh, uh, we, I'm thinking right now of a single mother who is slightly mentally disabled in another congregation who the ladies of the church realized she had a teenage son, she's a single mom, she's got her own disabilities that she's dealing with, we need to help her get to church. I mean, you know how hard it is to get to church with a mom and a dad and everything else is fine. Uh, think what it's like for her. And so people in the church would be on the lookout for that. College students who need either uh, uh, transportation or special encouragement. You know, sometimes it's, it's dangling a meal in front of a college student. You know, hey, come come to church and we'll 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 break bread after church. Many college students won't turn down uh, an offer like that. Might not be church in the first instance that you're coming to, but the opportunity to break bread with you, they'll come. Or the 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 deacons had uh, in in at First Jackson, there was a couple in the church. Both members of the couple were blind. Both of them were blind, 
And so the, the deacons had long before I ever suggested it, um, started going to their house and picking them up and bringing them to church and getting them settled in Sunday school and church. They were always on the lookout for people who might need special help and assistance to come to church. Don't just wait for the officers of the church to do that, the ministers or the deacons or the elders. You be on the lookout for people who you could assist or woo to getting to church. Getting, getting to church can be an, a special challenge for some people in some circumstances. However, we can help them overcome those challenges to be blessed with our presence and to bless us with theirs as we gather to worship the living God. That is a good thing. So encourage and help others to come to worship. Come to worship yourself. Encourage and help others to come. Third, come expectantly. Come expectantly. Um, I bet you're like me in that you have gone through seasons in life where you felt like you were on mental autopilot. Not just for one Sunday, but for many, many Sundays. I, I've gone through different times of my life for, for various reasons where it's, it, you know, I felt like, boy, all I am is a warm body and a heartbeat sitting in the pew. Um, and, and yet, the Lord did great things even in those seasons. So let me encourage you to come expectantly. Um, God always uses his word when the people of God are gathered to worship him. He always uses his word. I don't mean that he always uses it right then, but he always uses it. You never know when the fruit is going to come, but the fruit is going to come. You know the, the story of the man in New England sitting under an apple tree, uh, reading a sermon that had been preached by a Puritan just less than a hundred years before, and the man was in his 80s and he was converted. You never know when the fruit of God's word is going to come home, and you never know where the, where the, the, the way that God is going to deal with you when you gather. So come expectantly. Something is going to happen. In fact, remember that you have, even in the call to worship, you are hearing something amazing in a public service of worship. One, one of the great things about a public worship service like you experience here at First Pres, and let me just quickly say, this is not experienced in every Christian church. What, what you get here, at, and I don't just mean the quality of the preaching, I don't just mean the, the, the content of the service, I, I, I mean the, 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 the whole attitude towards what is trying to be done in public worship and the various elements that are included in that public worship and the focus on Christ and the basis in the Word of God, do not assume that this is normal. It is not normal. There are not many places where you are served the diet. And again, it's not just the preaching. It's the whole thing. Uh, it, it, just think, you, you get to hear the word read every service. Do you know how many people around the world, including Christians, who don't get to hear that in a public service of worship? You, you get to hear rich prayers prayed. You, you get to sing really, really big, glorious truths together. And don't, don't assume that that just happens everywhere. It doesn't. So come expectantly. And even think of it, when, when, when you hear the pastor give the call to worship, realize what is happening. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and lost the ability to continue in communion with God in his nearer presence, I mean, think of that. In Genesis 3, 8, they hear the word, they hear God walking, the Lord walking in the cool of the day, and they hide themselves. And then when God pronounces his judgment on their sin, what does he say? Go. 
go, go, go out of this garden, go out of the, and he places the, the cherubim at the, at the entrance so that they cannot come back in to enjoy his nearer presence. They're sent away. Go is what he says because of their sin. Now listen to what Psalm 95 says. Come. Come. You, you, you hear what's going on there? The gospel is being announced to you even in the call to worship. The, your sin deserved to hear God's go, go away. But in Christ, what's his message to you? Come. Come to me, all you are who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come in the name of Jesus. Come in faith in Jesus and come to me and be with me and commune with me. We need to be expectant about that. Um, it, every Sunday is not going to be the same. Every Sunday is not going to be a mountaintop. We may well mentally coast through a Sunday or two or three or five or ten. But God's word is going to do its work. So come expectantly. Uh, God does his work when his people are gathered in a special way. And that word will not return void. Even if it seems to you to have completely missed you on that Sunday or that month, God's word will not return void. I think I've shared with you before that I got to be, my, my ruling elder, Don Brazil, died of cancer. Um, I, had, I had 70 ruling elders at, at First Pres Jackson, but Don was one of my closest friends. And his wife, Missy Ree, had been my executive assistant. And she died on exactly the seventh, the, the, the day of the seventh year that she had been my executive assistant. Just like Missy Ree, she worked all the way up to the end with cancer. And then six years later, almost to the day, Don died of cancer. And I got to visit him the night of his death. And he had not spoken to anyone for almost 24 hours. In fact, uh, the family was a little bit reluctant to let me go back and see him because he was really struggling. He was struggling to breathe. He was in a lot of pain. And I just don't think they, they didn't want me to see that and they didn't want to have to watch me see that. But they reluctantly let me go back to see Don. And they warned me now. They said, he's not spoken to anybody today. And I walked in the room and I just said, Don, it's Lig. And his eyes immediately opened. Now, I, I've reflected on that moment for many years. And I, I think it's not just that Don and I were friends and we had spent many a time in conversation. It's that he was used to hearing my voice in the pulpit. And we heard his pastor's voice. He opened his eyes for the last time. And we had just a brief conversation of seconds where I was able to encourage him that soon he would be with the Lord and that the fight would be over and that we would be okay. And uh, I, I just realized what a privilege to be the voice in people's ears, heralding them the word of God, heralding them the gospel. You never know how that's going to cash out. You never know when that's going to come back. But I've seen it as a pastor over and over again. Many, many times where there's been an emergency in a family and I could just get there and then the person, the husband, the wife, the child, the mother, the father would hear my voice speak to them. They knew the, the pastor is here. And I think it all went back to what they were hearing in the public service of worship. You never know how the Lord is going to use that in your life. So come expectantly. Fourth, fourth, here's the fourth thing. Come prepared. Come prepared. Um, in, mo in most things in life, the more you put into them, the more you get out of them. I know that First Pres, for instance, puts your, your bulletin, your order of worship up early so that you can see what's going to happen. Now, that's not so that you can avoid certain people preaching. 
uh, that, that's, that's so you can prepare yourself, right? That's so you can prepare yourself for the public worship service. And the more preparation you put in, okay, I know that those songs are going to be sung. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to use public worship to try to memorize hymns. You know, singing hymns over and over have been the main ways that I have memorized hymns. I, I didn't sit down and think, I'm going to try and memorize hymns. Many of you know Doug Kelly uh, from Dillon, South Carolina, and Moore County, North Carolina, who's preached here often. When, when I would be at Doug's house on Sunday afternoon, usually he would retire from lunch after a time. We would talk for a long time at the, at the Sunday dinner table, and then he would go to his study, and he would have a Bible on his left knee and a hymnal on his right knee. And he would sit there, and he would spend a couple of hours memorizing. Well, most of us are not like Doug Kelly. Most of us do not memorize that. But what we do is by singing songs over and over, we can memorize them. So be deliberate about that. Um, I, I've, I've watched R.C. Sproul and Jim Boyce on a platform ribbing one another about not knowing all the stanzas of hymns. You know, they would be standing up to sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and Jim Boyce would have the hymnal in his hand, and R.C. would look over at him, and he'd have his hands behind his back and, and just, just singing at the top of his lungs and kind of looking at Jim. Hey, you really need the hymnal for A Mighty Fortress is Our God? Well, mem- memorize, memorize the songs as you sing them. You sing great hymns and songs in this congregation. Memorize those words. Those words will come back to you in time of need. I'll say as a pastor, I'm constantly faced with circumstances where I'm thinking to myself, what in the world could I say to this person in this circumstance? What, What could I possibly say that would be helpful and encouraging and true and good and timely? And I cannot tell you how many times that a psalm or a hymn has come to mind, and it's that word that I can share with that person that helps them in time of need. Well, when you memorize psalms and hymns, you can do the same thing with one another. And by the way, I've had that happen. Many members of my congregation have shared a, a phrase or a sentence from a song or a psalm or a scripture passage that have been exactly what I needed in that moment. So come prepared. Study, study those hymns ahead of time. Uh, know that there are baptisms that are coming up on a particular Sunday and start praying for those families and for those children. Know that the Lord's Supper is coming up and prepare your heart to commune with God and his people. Utilize the ways that the pastors and elders of the congregation sort of inform you ahead of time of what's happened. They even tell you what your sermon, your summer Sunday school series is. So you kind of know what's coming uh, during uh, these special uh, summer lectures. Utilize those to prepare. But let me say one other thing. Also come unprepared. See, because a lot of times we don't prepare, and just because you don't prepare, don't not come. Come, okay? Come even if you're unprepared, because the Lord will bless you when you gather with his people. It's good for us to prepare to worship, but even when we haven't, come even unprepared, and the Lord will bless you through his means of grace. Fifth, come knowing what you are looking for. Come knowing what you are looking for. Uh, Over the last 50 years, a lot of Christians have warned about the consumer mentality that a lot of people have about worship. You know, that they, they think worship is all about them. It's all about their preferences, what they want, what, what sort of songs do they want, what sort of musical style do they want, what sort of this do they want, what, what sort of that. Do they, it's all sort of consumer-centered. What's in it for me? You know, I, I want you to do it the way I want you to do it. And people have rightly warned that that's not a good attitude to have in coming to public worship because in the end, the consumer in worship is not us, it's God. God. But you do need to understand what you're coming for. Understanding what, you, what, you, what you're coming for is really important. Ultimately, I hope what you're coming for is God. You know, that you want 
to commune with God. You, you want your soul to do business with God, and you want God to do business with your soul. You want his word. You, 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 you want him to speak into your life. You want to know his presence. You want to gather with his people with him. You want to come to Jesus. I, I, you need to know that, that I'm, I'm coming to God. I'm coming to Christ. I'm coming for communion with him. But in the context of knowing what you're coming for, you need to think both about what you are going to get and what you are going to give. You need to know what you're going to get and what you're going to give. That is, what is it, what's the ultimate thing that you are meant to get out of worship? It's God. That's the ultimate thing that you're meant to get out of worship. Some of you will know Don Carson. Uh, Don is a world-renowned uh, New Testament scholar, now suffering for, from Parkinson's. And many years ago, Don said this, one of the first things we need to realize about worship is that worship is a transitive verb. Now, my grammarians in the room, just let this warm the cockles of your heart, okay? Remember, let's, let's go all the way back to high school. What is a transitive verb? A transitive verb is a verb that requires a direct object. So he said we need to remember that worship is a transitive verb, and the direct object that is required by the word worship is God. So when we come to worship, we don't come to worship peace or joy or an experience. We come to worship God. And Carson goes on to say this, if you come to worship looking for joy, you won't find it. But if you come to worship looking for God... God says, I have come that your joy may be made full. If you come to worship looking for peace, you won't find it. But if you come to worship looking for God, he will give you peace. If you come to worship looking for an experience, you won't find it. But if you come looking for God, you will experience something of the blessing of communion with him. And what, what often happens is we will have a particular experience in a particular service of worship, and we will want to reduplicate that. And that's rarely how things work. But if we will come to worship looking to get God, looking for God, seeking God more than anything else, what, is, what does Jesus say to the woman in the world? God is seeking worshipers. He's seeking us. So he wants us to seek him. He's seeking us. So come seek him in worship. And when you do that, you come to God. Give him the glory due his name. You come to seek God. What you find out is God blesses you with himself. I, I, I find it fascinating that God tells Moses to tell Aaron to tell the priest, do not let the people come to bless me without sending them away with a blessing. And that's when he says, tell them this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So he says, do not let them come bless me without you blessing them. Because, what's the principle? You can't outbless God. You, can, you will never outbless God. And so when you come to bless his holy name, he intends to bless you. And so you need to be aware of what, what is it that I'm here for? I'm here for God. I'm here for Christ. I'm here to give to him the glory to you, his name, but I'm also here to get the blessing of his presence that only he can bestow. Come knowing what you're looking for. And sixth, come understanding how God uses the means of grace in public worship. And think specifically about five things. The singing, especially what, what God is doing in singing is he is knitting the truth that you say that you believe with the, the melody and the singing of God's people so that the truth is wedded to your affections. 
You know, there, there are songs that I find it really hard to get through because of their associations. So I, I, I just mentioned Don and Missy Ree, Brazil. At Missy Ree's funeral service, she requested before she died that we would sing for all the saints. And the minute she said it, I thought, okay, that's it. I'm ruined on that song forever. Uh, and I cannot sing that song without thinking about Missy Ree. Um, and I blubbered all the way through that song at the end of the service, you know, thinking, Miss Ray, I can't believe you did this to me, you know, because that, that song's emotional enough uh, with, without adding that. But that's what happens in singing. The truth gets wedded to our affections in singing. That's what's happening. And then that means that even if you are a lousy singer, singing is meant for you. My dad was... Um, Born and reared in Union County, South Carolina, was a U.S. Marine who fought in the Second World War and could not carry a tune in a bucket. I mean, he could not sing at all. And one of the great memories of my life was sitting next to him, missing every single note in the hymn, every single note, and thinking, there's my dad, former Marine, not ashamed to sing. That's awesome. And, uh, and, and believe me, that's wed in my memory and in my affections as I sing those, so, those same songs that I sang with him as a boy. Uh, realize that in the reading of the word, you're hearing something amazing. Do you realize that there are five billion people on the planet that never hear what you get to hear Sunday after Sunday here at First Press Columbia? That is the word of God read in your own language in a public service of Christian worship as a means of grace. There are five billion people plus on this, fam on this planet that have never heard that. You get to hear it, you don't even think about it on Sunday. But your forefathers were burned at the stake so that you could hear the word of God read to you in your own language. And, and God is speaking very directly to you when the word is read. Um, in, when, when prayers are lifted up, that, by the way, this is the part of public worship that requires my most concentration. I cannot tell you how many years I struggled with my mind wandering in public prayer. It's one reason I'm so thankful for well-structured public prayers. And what I will often do is I will say to myself, okay, now he's praying praise. Now he's praying confession. Now he's praying for pardon. Now he's praying intercessions. Now he's praying thanksgivings. You know, and I'll just outline the prayer to, to walk along with the prayer. And that's why you're blessed with really good prayers in this congregation. I don't think I've ever heard a bad prayer uttered from the pulpit of First Presbyterian Church, Columbia. That's what's happening. Well, I'm, I'm already out of time. It's 1044. I haven't gotten to preaching and to uh, the administration of the word and sacraments. But the, the point is simply this. Every part of that public worship service is meant to bless you. It is meant to equip you to glorify God. And it is meant to do good to your souls. So come understanding how God is going to use those means in your life because he is going to use those means in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity to think about what we're doing when we come to worship. Help us to worship in spirit and in truth and to go away with a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.